folks filing in here or welcome you to the, uh, the last presentation of the day. Uh, this is Team Zero G. Uh, they're going to talk to us a little bit about um, their ideas for affordable debris remediation. So with that, why don't you take it away. Good afternoon. <laughs> Good afternoon. We are Team Zero G and this is Project Orion. I am Andrew Pierce, the team lead. The assistant team lead and head of communications is Elle Carlson. The lead editor and head of capture is Ian Bigger. The structural team lead is Daniel Griffith. The power subsystem lead is Stephen Kerrigan. And our CAD design and system concept was Joshua Pukes. We're gonna go through the system concept today and the various subsystems that make up Project Orion. We're going to talk about what we plan on doing for detail and acknowledge the professors that got us this far. So a growing problem right now in lower Earth orbit is space debris. Um, as we keep sending things to space, the leftover payloads like the flying satellites um, are just left to drift. There are even satellite collisions and explosive decommissions creating pieces of debris. There are current efforts to get rid of space debris, um, notably the ESA's Remove Debris um, that uses a harpoon and net capture and deorbits a defunct satellite. But the space debris problem that our detail team wants to focus on is small debris. Small debris, if left to accelerate, becomes a very dangerous problem for communications devices and for manned missions. So using, uh, so using the Celeste Track um, online site, we found that uh, there are thousands of pieces of debris above 7.62 centimeters with a uh, moving at orbital velocity. So we used a advanced orbital mechanics program to send up a theoretical um, spacecraft to, to sort of get a, a testable velocity difference, which is why, how we came up with Project Orion. Project Orion is a CubeSat sized device that has a high strength bag attached to a double gear closing mechanism. Um, once the debris hits the bag, the closing mechanism activates, capturing the piece of debris. Um, we want to build a communications device that detects the impact and, we, and activates the closing mechanism. We want to build a power system that powers both the closing mechanism and the communications device. We want to build a structure to hold everything in place. Um, our chronological concept of operations um, as in how we're going to be tested it on the ground is Orion will prepare for the impact. To keep in the spirit of the space mission, it will start in a closed position and then open. We will fire a high velocity piece of debris at the bag. Once the debris impacts the bag, our communications device will activate, telling us to activate the closing mechanism. Once the closing mechanism activates, the piece of debris is captured so our primary objectives is to build a, uh, build a capture system that can withstand a high speed impact, to build a capture system that can immediately close the bag after the high speed impact, to build a capture system that can pop effectively replace the bagging component of the capture system, um, to build a communication system that can detect the presence of the mass upon impact and to build the entire system for under $1,000. Our secondary objectives that we will possibly get to is the, to test the effective angle of impact upon our capture system and to possibly use a potentiometer to detect the mass itself. But to talk about the system concept in detail is Joshua Peters. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Joshua Peterson. I'll be going over our system concept for Project Orion. In the development of the Orion system, we came up with five requirements. These requirements are the reusability requirement, in which Project Orion must be able to capture at least five pieces of debris. 
our durability requirement, which states that under nominal testing conditions, which are a 1.5 kilogram mass fired at less than 15 meters per second, it must sustain damage in the form of dents of no greater than 0.1 inches in radius. Our communications requirement states that it must be in continuous wireless communication with the command laptop at a distance of no less than 50 feet. Our power system requirement says that the power system must output 23 amps in order to provide sufficient power to all of the subsystems. And our cost requirement says that all testing and building must be done for less than $1,000. From those requirements, this is the design for Project Orion that was developed. It's a three-part design with the front part shown in the transparent blue being the capture portion, the back part shown in the gray is our component holding section, and the rings in the center are our closing capture rings. The design drivers that helped us to develop this design were the material choice, our deorbit method, our power system design, and our subsystem cost analysis. The biggest driver for this was our subsystem cost analysis as it limited us on what types of materials as well as the sizes of materials that we could choose. So that affected the shape of the system as well as what it could be made out of. The next most impacting design driver was our power system and deorbit designs as both affected the size of the system requiring different volumes that needed to be filled. These are the governing equations that we used to further Project Orion. The first ones are our orbital mechanics equations. These helped us learn how long Orion will be in different parts of its phasing maneuver orbits and allowed us to develop the requirements for our power subsystem. Below that are the is the volume equation for a cylinder. This helped us to determine the actual size of Orion based off of how much space the power system and the capture system would take up. For analysis, we looked at the orbital mechanics, the, we want to perform future impact analysis, and a cost budget. Shown here on the slide is the current cost budget on a subsystem level for Orion, showing what each subsystem will cost, as well as the cost that was used to create the model we have in today's presentation. In summary, out of the five requirements we developed for the system level, three of those have been met so far, those being the communication system, which said we had to communicate wirelessly at a distance of no less than 50 feet. The system we have is currently able to do over 400 feet, so that requirement was satisfied. Our power system needed to output the 23 amps, and with its current design, it is able to do that and our budget of $1,000 after allocating funds to each subsystem and the model comes in at only $970, which is less than the 1,000. Our other two requirements for reusability and durability still need to be tested, and our goal is to prove that both of those can be met in our detailed project. I will now be passing it off to Daniel Griffith for our structure subsystem. Thank you. As you said, my name is Daniel Griffith, and I'll be going over our structure subsystem. So the objectives that we need to meet for the structure subsystem is that it needs to be able to survive without significant deformation impacts from our test, as well as <clears throat> hold all the other, hold and protect all the other subsystems necessary for a successful test. So some of the requirements we have, we have the impact survivability requirement. This is, we need to be able to survive a 1.5 kilogram object traveling at 15 meters per second uh, at an angle of up to uh, five degrees. The, the container requirement needs to be able to contain all the other subsystems based off of their volumes. The cost needs to be under $400 to meet the current budget given to this subsystem. And Team Zero G needs to be able to manufacture Orion uh, either with the facilities on campus or with the opportunities provided by Henry Riddle uh, Prescott for capstone engineering teams. So as Josh already mentioned, this is the design, this is the outside view and the inside view. The front part of the design is where the capture subsystem will be, and the back part is going to house and protect the electrical and communications subsystems. So we ended up choosing aluminum 
uh, 6061 for our material due to its high availability, ease of manufacturability, and its low cost. Uh, then our design metrics using alumina were the yield strength of alumina, the manufacturability of the material, the availability of the material, and the cost. The equations that we used uh, were all for the uh, impact of the impact analysis, where the first equation is the energy absorbed by uh, an area where the object will be hit. Uh, and then the second energy equation is just the energy of the moving object. Combining the two and solving for the stress, uh, we can find, we can see exactly how much stress the aluminum structure will be taking depending on the impact. We also added a factor safety of 1.5 and a uh, angle of impact because we're not going to be directly hitting it. We're doing uh, any hits that it will take will be at an angle. So using that, uh, using the yield strength of 240 megapascals for our aluminum alloy, and assuming uh, the area of impact of the object we're shooting at is going to be around 45, but it could be a little less. We found that our it will currently using our current model it will fail if hit. However, this is a conservative analysis as the energy equation only takes into account the energy at the spot of the impact. It doesn't take into account the energy absorbed by the rest of the structure. For the rest, the cost was $350. Uh, currently, using uh, looking online for the current amount of aluminum that we will need, the, there were multiple sources for aluminum, so it was very easy to find, and all the aluminum ships within two weeks, so it shouldn't be any problem uh, to receive the aluminum. <clears throat> so in summary, we uh, currently, due to our analysis, uh, conservative analysis, we do not meet the impact survivability, but we do meet the containment, the cost, and the manufacturability. And with that, I'll be handing it over to Ian Bigger to go over the capture subsystem. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, hi, my name is uh, Ian Bigger. I am going over the uh, capture subsystem for a project to run. So the objectives that we had arrived at um, for the uh, capture subsystem was the, survive, uh, the survivability objective as well as the containment objective. The survivability objective for uh, the capture subsystem states that we must uh, receive uh, or capture uh, debris at an impact speed of uh, up to 15 meters per second as well as a mass of uh, up to two kilograms. The containment objective for uh, the uh, capture subsystem for uh, Ryan I stated that we must be able to house and hold and contain the debris within the capture subsystem until the end of mission time. So we had to come up with uh, requirements to ensure that our, de our design drivers were meeting the uh, objectives in the capture subsystem. Uh, this was um, come down to uh, the debris volume containment requirement, which is we have to have at least 0 0.35 meters cubed worth of volume to contain five pieces of debris. Um, we must be able to contain at least seven kilograms worth of mass. Uh, we must uh, be able to um, receive impacts of up to 15 meters per second. Um, and then we cannot lose more than 10% of our tensile strength um, due to ultraviolet uh, uh, degradation um, after a course of 200 hours. Um, the uh, capture subsystem must be uh, manufactured by October um, 25th, and it must cost less than $200. So as you can see here in the design, um, going back to our concept of operation, the debris will enter into the uh, opening of the capture subsystem, and then the debris, once making contact with the back of the bag, will um, be detected by the communication subsystem. And then once the uh, communication subsystem detects the presence of a mass entering into the bag, the closing sub subsystem uh, will then be engaged, and then the bag will be sealed off to ensure that the debris is captured and then does not uh, exit out of the, uh, the front of the capture subsystem. So in order to uh, ensure that we selected the correct material for the uh, bagging system, uh, we designed a trade study. Um, the design metrics for the trade study were the uh, availability, manufacturability, price, weight, tensile strength, and resistance to ultraviolet radiation um, degradation. Out of these uh, trade uh, design metrics, we selected carbon fiber to be the uh, best material to make the uh, bagging system. Uh, it should be clarified that the carbon fiber will be in a fabric form and will not be in a matrix resin. The governing equations for uh, this uh, subsection uh, includes the tensile strength equation, 
the volume of a cylinder equation as well as the surface area of the cylinder. Um, the uh, tensile strength equation listed here is uh, to help better um, understand the uh, effect of the transverse fibers as well as the longitudinal fibers within the uh, construction of the fabric using the material um, and how they both uh, assist in the uh, absorbing of the impact energy. The volume <coughs> of the cylinder equation is uh, used to ensure that our bag for the capture subsystem um, fits within the, uh, the, the structure of our iron. Um, the surface area of the cylinder is used to determine how much uh, fabric we need to use um, in order to construct it uh, because we expect uh, we expect it um, to use multiple plies and have to sew them together um, in order to be able to uh, survive impacts from debris. We can't we can't do it in one, one sheet. Um, so the first uh, analysis that we did was the uh, <coughs> failure analysis for the uh, the bad track. Um, we uh, assumed that the uh, area of impact would be at least 45 uh, centimeters squared, and uh, we tested the um, stresses that would be experienced on the surface of the bag um, at from 10 meters per second, 12.5 meters per second, and 15. Um, as you can see, according to the graph, um, our bag would not experience failure when we assume that the bag would be made out of four layers of hardware. The uh, maximum stress that we will experience with uh, 15 meters per second uh, impact with the debris will be uh, 3.49 uh, gigapascals, and our failure stress is uh, 4.21. Um, the next analysis that we will have to do in the future, um, when provided time, will be the UV degradation of the uh, bad fabric. Um, currently, it is uh, very, very hard to find accurate and concise numbers on exactly how carbon fiber uh, degrades, um, especially in a ground surface uh, testing elements. Um, <clears throat> so we would just be uh, simply uh, testing a specimen of fabric in a uh, tensile uh, test machine, and then we will have a similar sized uh, piece of fabric that will be exposed to 200 hours of uh, sunlight, and then we just want to test if uh, we lose uh, more than 10% of our tensile strength. <clears throat> so in summary, for the uh, capture subsystem, our volume containment uh, requirement was uh, to be uh, at least 0 0.1 meters cubed and our analysis value was 0 0.35. So we definitely uh, verified um, that requirement. Um, we also verified the mass and the debris requirements. The um, requirements um, that have not been fulfilled but need further testing will be our uh, UV light degradation, as we cannot conduct the experiment now, but we will be doing that in detail. And the manufacturability uh, requirement that needs to be made um, by uh, October 23rd uh, we'll have to be verified. However, the cost requirement for our fabric was not verified, as um, it, the uh, amount of fabric needed was approximately 11 yards um, to construct the bag out of four plots. Um, however, this will be remedied in the future, as Patrick, the uh, one in charge of AxFab um, building on campus, has um, offered to provide us with the additional fabric needed to keep us within our budget. So we'll be spending $200 and then any surplus over that um, will, be, will be provided to us to ensure that we can uh, construct the bag system. And with that, I would like to pass it on to Stephen for the uh, power system. Thank you, Ian. Awesome, thank you. All right, thank you all for sticking around. My name is Stephen. I'll be covering the power subsystem for Orion. All right, so the objectives of the power system were to be designed in order to accommodate the other subsystems which run electronically. And this was done by calculating the power that each one will be required for these different modes of operation. Just a side note, if you can see the bag closure, that will be requiring the most power. So that's where most of it will be going. And next we have the requirements. The first requirement was a cycle life requirement of a minimum of 50 to 60 cycles. This was calculated as a uh, 36 days of uh, testing that will be going on next semester for fall 2019. And the next requirement is a operating temperature. This is a range between 10 and 30 degrees Celsius. All this does is ensure the longevity and safety of our battery pack. And the next one is our affordability requirement. What this was, was a requirement less than $150 and we stay below that. And the next requirement is a 
current another range between 0.21 amps up to 10.60 amps. This is just the range of currents that our other subsystems are going to be pulling from the battery pack. Okay, shown here is the design of the current battery pack. As you can see, there are 21 18650 batteries. They're lithium ion cells. They are 3.6 volts and 1,500 milliamp hours each. And let's see. As for a safety feature, we have a battery management system. All this is going to do is allow us to recharge and also ensure that we don't get any thermal runaway or venting in our cells. So the design metrics that influenced that design that you just saw was the performance and degradation rates that we took into account. What we wanted to do was ensure the performance was as close to the specified values from the manufacturer and make sure those values stay constant throughout the whole semester that way we don't get any usability losses that we yeah, you know usability losses we'll get constant results throughout the semester the next design metric is the availability of the components that make up the the battery pack and with that that's just in the event that we ever need to replace or buy more parts if we don't have them they'll always be available to buy and those will be shipped quickly so the governing equations that was used for the operating modes seen in a few slides before we use the power equation to get those by getting the voltages and the currents from all the other subsystems, determining what mode is going to be using what amount of power. And then we have a C-rate formula. This is just going to give us, we have a C-rate formula that gave us a 0.5 C rate, which is going to be a two hour uh, discharge time. And here, these are the analysis and results that we used to design the current battery pack. Here on the left, this is, uh, as you can see here, at even 100% uh, depth of discharge, you'll still be getting about 3,000 cycles, which far exceeds our requirement. And the temperature discharge, it was zero, it was about 10 degrees Celsius to 30, which adds up to about a 90 to 100% uh, capacity retention, which is also exceeds our requirements. Here on the bottom right, this is a software that we use, a uh, free online software that we use to design the battery pack that we have currently. And just to summarize, all the requirements were met, and those requirements were the cycle life, the operating temperature range, the affordability of less than $150, and a maximum current, it's more of a range. This is just the lowest to the highest uh, power draw, or current draw. So next, I would like to pass it off to L. Carson to discuss the communication subsystem. All right, thank you, Stephen. So my name is L. Carson. I'm going to be covering our communication subsystem today. So the first thing we're going to be talking about is our objectives and requirements for the communication subsystem. Uh, comms only had one objective that we are going to be trying to satisfy. So uh, it's our mass detection. Uh, objective and just to clarify on that we are not going to be calculating the mass as it's coming in from the debris we're only detecting its presence there are going to be four requirements that will satisfy our objective or help us satisfy our objective so the first one is going to be on our bit rate so we need to be able to translate or transmit at least 12 bits from Orion to the ground control and where team 0g will be able to evaluate the information coming in we will also need to evaluate the baud rate, which will help us maintain a wireless connection with Orion during testing. We will also need to assess the temperature of the internal devices as we're going through testing procedures. It's really important that our devices don't overheat when we're doing our testing. And finally, we will be covering our cost requirement. So this will be also very important as we don't go over budget. So on our design, if you look over here, um, up top, that is going to be the central communications device that we'll be using. It's called MyRio 1900. Uh, it will be assessing, it will be directly communicating um, from Orion to ground control where we can assess all of the data that's coming in. 
We will also be looking at the mechanical potentiometer. So this device will help us assess whether or not there is a space debris present in our capture system. So our design metrics are the same as our requirements in order to numerically satisfy those requirements. And so for, uh, it was bit rate, baud rate, and temperature compatibility, as well as cost. So obviously we wanted to optimize each of the different design metrics when we were making our design choices for which devices to use in the communication subsystem. And so our governing equations that went along with those design metrics as well were mostly in the heat transfer department. So we performed uh, conduction and convection heat transfer coefficient, or heat transfer equations uh, in order to determine whether or not our communications devices would overheat during testing. Radiation was not calculated as part of these governing equations because our devices are going to be housed within Orion, and so it will be on the back compartment of the overall structure, and so it won't be exposed to the sun at all. So in our analysis and results, uh, just a quick reminder, so our minimum requirement was 12 bits uh, for the bit rate. The bob rate, the minimum requirement was 400. Uh, the temperature compatibility had to be within a range of negative 20 to 40 degrees Celsius, and our cost needed to be less than $150 to meet budget requirements. And so up here, I have a subsystem summary um, of what we needed to accomplish. All of our requirements were met. Uh, the bit rate was satisfied with uh, the specifications and data sheets uh, for the devices that we'll be using in the subsystem. The baud rate was calculated out to be greater than 400. Uh, we will be using a 9600 baud rate in order to leave room for any additional information as well as make sure that the, that information is being transferred to us in a timely manner. Uh, the temperature, uh, the, according to the governing equations, the heat transfer, uh, the, the internal device temperature was only going to rise by approximately four degrees for our testing procedure, and so that requirement was also satisfied. And then our cost budget, the, the only device that we will need to purchase is the mechanical potentiometer, and the device, the total cost for that device is $149, which also satisfies our $150 cost requirement. So now I'm going to pass it on to Andrew. He's going to wrap this up. So we, we considered, uh, when we got to the end of prelim, we considered what we still needed to do for detail. One of the major things was the impact survivability model. Um, we wanted to get a more accurate model for the structure because uh, 15 meters per second is a bit conservative. And um, we wanted to get a better model for the uh, difference in velocity because um, 15 meters per second is also very conservative, especially at orbital velocity. We wanted to make improvements to the power subsystem design so um, it can run efficiently without you know, overheating or possibly degradating the batteries faster than we previously believed would they would degradate. Um, and we also want to integrate the communication system to possibly make the closing mechanism autonomous so we can test the impact, uh, we can do more tests of the impact with autonomy because it's all controlled from the laptop as is. So we went over the system concept. Um, uh, we went through the general subsystems of Project Orion and we went over what we learned and what we want to do for detail. We will acknowledge Dr. Briner. He uh, gave, did a lot of things uh, to give us the development of the communication system. Professor Mangum uh, helped us with our technical report aspect of prelim. Dr. Benavides is the one who gave us the original orbital mechanics model that inspired the entire project, and he gave us a lot of presentation advice. Uh, Dr. Lestari helped with the impact analysis and gave us suggestions for future impact analysis. Dr. Martin gave us presentation advice, and we would like to thank Dr. White for everything. We are now opening the floor to questions and suggestions. software that you use to do the orbital mechanics um, analysis? What software was that? Um, so the uh, orbital mechanics. You're fine. Is this one? Yeah. Oh, it is? 
um, the orbital mechanics uh, model um, was originated from um, the Iridium-33 Cosmo-2251 collision. Um, and then what I did was I just went and got some classical orbital elements of any specific uh, piece of debris that was still in orbit from that. And then we tried to do a phase maneuver um, with that. So what we did was we assumed that Orion, if we were in a space environment, just to, to, to derive the requirements and keep the flavor of space in this, um, we went ahead and we assumed that our satellite would be in the exact same orbit, orbital plane, and then we would adjust and have a phasing maneuver to rendezvous with it. And then what we would did was we adjusted the amount of time that the phasing maneuver would take um, because we felt it acceptable to be at about 15 meters per second currently due to our impact model. However, I could stretch it or shrink it as much as possible. However, we wanted to stay away from um, having the phasing maneuver last too long and have, like decreasing the uh, difference in velocity as to um, just unpredictable events because it's already trying to find a needle in the haystack around on a piece of debris with the satellite. Um, and so we would like to have this as quickly as possible. But that's for the... So, so you did some analysis to kind of at least quantify that 15 meters per second? Yes. Because no. Oh, yeah, and so, well, this was all done in MATLAB. And, um, and so what we did was we, uh, we had a full range, um, I think, it took uh, at least two orbits to 100 orbits was where we was where we chose. Really so. Okay, thank you. Um, for for some of your requirements, um, again, I think they're a, a little lacking in terms of specificity. Um, so the dimensions, the weights, the um, you know just how things are going to be integrated together. Um, so I'd like to see some more allocation of what those uh, would be. Um, you mentioned, I think, briefly about the, the bag, um, but I didn't see any mention of the closing mechanism and how that was going to be, how was it going to work. Um, my first thought is if you're going to get five pieces in this bag, you're going to close it, but then you're going to have to open it again, or you're going to do like a diaper genie situation, close it. I mean, so that needs to be thought through a little bit. Um, because in microgravity, it's, you know, you open up that bag, it's going to come right back out. Um, let's see, the, the communications, it said something about less than 50 feet, but it didn't give like a maximum distance, so an operational range of the communication and, and how you're going to test the, the different ranges of that, I think should be uh, thought of in your detailed design. Um, and, and I think this kind of goes back to what we said in the last presentation, um, kind of separating the, dis the difference between what you're designing to go in space versus what you're using to test it on the ground. Um, I think needs to be just kind of clarified a little bit because um, it kind of got a little muddled in my mind about why you're using this particular battery. And I think it was because of the testing or, or something like that. Um, so just kind of clarifying some of that um, yeah, I think that's kind of, for the most part, what I had. All right, guys. Um, the, the presentation was very visually appealing. Uh, it, was, it, it was pretty simple. It was pretty easy to look at. Um, your graphics were nice, etc. For, for the most part, there were a couple that I, I had a couple issues with. Um, I, I think you could have done with a little more, a little more practice with the presentation, and also consistency with your tables. A couple of them had different formatting, just little things. Um, uh, let, let's let's get into some of the the design, especially the generation of your requirements was bothersome to me. The whole time while you were going through, I I kept having the same questions. Requirements came up: is where was this generated? Right, where did the 50 feet come from for your communications? Um, where did the, the, the dent size, how is that a metric of how much damage your, your equipment can sustain? Um, where, where was that derived from? What was the, the impetus behind that? We'll, we'll start with the dent. Where did the dent come from? The dent came from some discussions I had with Dr. White on how much we could allow the system to deform under these impacts with the thickness of the material and how the closing rings that have to move on the interior work 
if it were to deform too much beyond that 0.1 inch, especially if it was right over one of the rails, it would eliminate all the effectiveness of the system, making it unusable. So, so that's, and, and this I wasn't clear on either, so that's a one-off. You can, you can take one hit at one centimeter. Is that, is that correct? Or is that you can, you can sustain multiple hits as long as they don't, you know? We can sustain exceed. multiple hits of that damage, but there are some locations where if that hit gets too large, it would cause catastrophic deformation. Okay. Um, the other thing with that is I'm, I'm not convinced, just looking at your system, I'm not convinced that the, the highest, highest risk to your system is a structural hit like on, on your substructure, I would be more concerned about a skin tear or something else. Because I'm not entirely sure of what the, the intended makeup is as far as where your bag interfaces. I'm still not clear on that. I'm not sure how much the, uh, the carbon fiber is supposed to protect the structure. Um, but even still, I think a little more thought needs to be put into what your failure modes are actually gonna look like and what an impact in space is going to look like because like like you mentioned 15 meters per second is very conservative um, especially with your orbital regime and that brings me to my next concern here uh, the intention of collecting five pieces of debris so let's just let's just bear in mind um, that when you're when you're rendezvousing with a object in an orbital plane, that's a one-off maneuver, right? If you want to rendezvous with another object in that same orbital plane, you're going to have to decrease your speed, re-rendezvous, because remember, when you boost speed to essentially catch up to something, uh, that's boosting your orbital space. You go faster, you go up, right? So how are you intending to collect multiple pieces in the same orbital plane without doing multiple maneuvers? Uh, the uh, original uh, intention was to uh, to match the orbit rendezvous, and then we will either be um, adjusting the uh, right ascension of the ascending node, or any other possible orbit, and just matching. Um, the interesting thing about the uh, Cosmo uh, 2251 Iridium 33 collision is that they have a common point in which most of the pieces of debris uh, intersect, which is where the collision occurred with Siberia. And so if we, the, the, the uh, plan here was to have our orbital uh, plane for uh, uh, Orion, um, intersecting that point. And then if the pieces of debris are all going through a common point, then we can adjust our phasing maneuvers to then intercept with pieces that would be at that common point. Um, however, that would be a logis logistical nightmare with uh, adjusting our attitude. And um, it's not exactly pertaining to our detailed project as we more intend to focus on um, what we can test. Um, and the orbital mechanics of it wasn't something that we were exactly testable. Um, so we included them into our objectives and our requirements to kind of show a little bit of why um, we, we're, we're doing this and the, the general idea of how this would work. But what we're really, really interested in is, is the capture subsystem, is having the bag, is having a closing mechanism, is it even a viable option that could be used in future missions? or should this be scrapped. Okay, and, and that's fair. It's just your, your orbital mechanics are what are, that's, that's what's determining that 15 meters per second. Yeah. Um, so since you have that specific number, I, I would like to know where that came from and why you generated that and, and what uh, interception plan you have that gave you that 15 meters per second, right? Yeah. Because that's gonna tell me if the bag is viable or not. A 15 meter per second uh, impact is gonna be very different than a 500 to 1400 meters per second impact is. Or 1500 per second. Yeah, or, yeah, or even, even higher if you're, if you're talking kind of what I heard you saying, which is a, an intercept. Yeah. You know, uh, and the, it's so with the, with, the, with the software or the, the code that I wrote, um, it gave uh, direction and the attitude that we would have to adjust to, as well as um, we were uh, able to adjust the ascending major axis. And we just, we just barely tinker with it and wait a good long time before we finally rendezvous. Um, and we got anywhere between 15, no, five meters per second and 250. 
and 250 was not going to work. But we, we kind of ballparked it and said five is where we'll, is where we'll start. Okay. I, I, think, I think that can be with a little more analysis. But that does bring me to my, uh, my next point, which is testing this thing. Um, what, what is your plan for, it, what, what is, tell me what your test setup looks like for a, a 15 meter per second projectile coming into this thing. So uh, we're still playing around with some ideas for that, but currently our idea is to sort of have a, like a uh, potato cannon and then have a one, you can make uh, objects that will fit that. We're thinking that's where the seven point, uh, we make, make about an inch and a half in radius or three inches diameter, about 7.62 centimeters in diameter. And that is actually where our right around 45 centimeters squared comes from on the other analysis is that's sort of what we found was a reasonable uh, testing plan for that. Okay, and, and that, that takes me back to the generation of requirements. Um, that requirement was generated based off what you intended to fire into your, your system. Um, at, at some point, did you have an average size of debris that you were looking at that you generated? Okay, but is that is that debris? I mean, it's debris after all. So that uh, that 45 centimeter impact area concerns me a little bit because you're not necessarily going to be looking at a nice impact surface every time, right? So that makes that that uh, impact you're going to be facing is quite different from having a, dealing with a sharp edge or a you know or a flat surface. So was that considered? Uh, yeah, um, when we were examining um, the illicit debris on uh, Celestra that was recorded after this collision, um, it said that the average uh, mass for um, the pieces of debris was about two, two kilograms, 1.5 to two kilograms. So that's where we, we came up with those original numbers. And then um, the size of the piece of debris was actually um, said to be on average 12.33 uh, uh, centimeters in diameter. Um, which would be a larger surface area, and then we shrank it down to about um, 7.62. Um, yeah, for, for testing purposes. Um, but yes, uh, the, uh, the actual shape of the piece of debris um, is not very, very representative of the piece of debris. However, if we have an irregular shape, um, it's extremely hard to mark. And it is, that, that's true. Um, the, the other aspect here is uh, you're talking about a horizontal test system, right? And you're testing it on Earth, and you have a massive advantage that you're putting into the system that you have a, you know, a 9.81 meter per second acceleration straight down. So as soon as that thing hits the bag, it's going to want to go right into the bag. And that's an artificial capture mode for you, because in zero G, you're going to be experiencing an elastic mode in that bag. And my understanding is currently that is not an automated capture system. Your capture system is, is uh, run off of your laptop. Is that correct? So you're engaging that capture. Okay. So you have microseconds to engage that capture before you're dealing with elastic effects in zero G. Um, so I, I think that may be a more important design point uh, that many give credit is that a human simply not going to be able to react fast enough. Yeah, and that's a, a, another reason why the, um, the difference in velocity was to be so slow was to try and minimize how much it wants to bounce back out. Um, obviously, if this was a real system, um, this would automatically be, you know, this would be automatic. But for our, again, for our current detail, it's something that we're working on. However, it's not something that we've completed yet, um, but it is definitely an objective. Sure. Um, Let's, let's talk about temperature real quick, because uh, I noticed some, some inconsistencies, again, with the requirements. Um, first off, the, the 10 to 30 degrees Celsius is not representative of space. So I didn't hear about a thermal subsystem. Maybe I, I just managed to miss it. Do you have some thermal regulation that you're, you're planning? Yes, yeah, so two weeks ago we had a uh, thermal range between negative 50 up to 150 degrees Celsius to kind of simulate the low Earth environment or low Earth orbit environment. So we just tweak that to fit it. I understand. Okay, I understand. I understand. You want? You're asking if there's a thermal system that would keep it between 10 to 30 degrees Celsius. 
And so those, that's just going to be our average temperature range here on campus if we're in that space. But if we were to design uh, some kind of thermal simulation to see if we were to place that system into a low Earth orbit type of environment ranging from negative 50 up to 100, 150 degrees Celsius, then we would for sure add some kind of insulation. And that is something we would definitely love to explore. It's just we haven't we haven't uh, dove into those quite yet. Okay. I guess I, I think that's I think that's everything I have for today. So thanks. Thank you. All right, yeah, one quick. Um, just uh, yeah, again um, on the requirements, I think that like I, I don't know to to drive it across real quick. Um, a lot of our requirements were uh, were originally designed for a space environment. Um, however, we decided as a group to uh, that, that that wasn't very accurate, nor was it very representative of our detail project because none of the requirements, such as like a space environment or the size or the volume of the automated, none of those were capable or within our capability on the the, the ground level that we would be testing it at. So we tried to switch. The requirements over to something that was representative of something that we could actually fit and simulate here on Embry-Riddle campus for the test. And so this is what you see here is the requirements designed for our specific case to uh, test the, the capture system and not what you would obviously see in space. Okay, well, I'll give you the, the same response that I gave the team earlier, which is your ability to test does not drive your requirements for the system. Um, remember, you are an Astro team, you're designing for a space environment. That's what you have to try and design to, whether you can test it or not. I understand in a, in a detailed situation, if you come and say, hey, you know, we were unable to test it just simply because of, of our, our limitations here on campus, but analysis showed that we should be able to survive the environment we designed to. That's what I want to see. You, know, you don't have to test it perfectly. I, I get it, you're limited. Um, but I. I don't want to see you uh, design a, a softball catcher instead of a orbital debris figure out basically is what you're looking at, right? Yeah. So design design for the environment that spawned the project. All right, thank you. Okay. Well thank you guys very much for sticking up.